tell everybody where you're at right now. I am currently in Yokohama, Japan. Local time, 10.30 a.m. on Saturday. <laughs> Dude, I love technology. It's crazy to think that you're on the other side of the world there. Oh, it's unbelievable, especially what's going on right now. You know, everybody's home back in the States, quarantining themselves. So we get a good chance to communicate a lot with family and friends. Dude, so what's the uh, the environment there right now? What's going on atmosphere wise? Uh, I mean, for a while it was it was kind of weird. You know, we were reading about what's going on back home in the U.S. and and then we look around here and people are still, you know, going to restaurants and the parks are full of kids. Uh, schools they shut schools down, but it just it didn't seem to slow many people down um, early. But now there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of concern. Are starting to rise again over here. Tokyo seeing an increase daily, and um, you know they're talking. There's talks of a lockdown here to happen soon. Our baseball is on hold right now. Uh, they pushed the uh, season opener opener back to you know kind of like a indefinite time frame right now. So it's starting to it's starting to pick up a little bit of. Uh, steam here as far as you know people going and shopping most things close on weekends they've asked restaurants and stuff like that to close on weekends but grocery stores still stay open and stuff like that wow what's now who are you playing for in japan i play for the yokohama bay stars okay and you're pitching right yes sir cool cool now, dude, before we jump into, obviously, want to talk about the Chicago Cubs and, and the World mm -hmm. Championship there and how all that went, but let's kind of go back a little bit. Tell me about kind of the way you grew up. Where, where were you born? I was born in uh, Urbana, Illinois, uh, central Illinois. Uh, most of my family still lives in the area there, uh, both on my mom and dad's side. Uh, my parents got divorced uh, when I was uh, at a young age. My mom remarried. We moved to the southern part of the state, uh, and that's where I grew up with uh, my mom and stepdad, going to high school there, and end up going to college in southern Illinois. And uh, just kind of, you know, that's my home. You know, that's that's where we call home, and we love it there. And all our, all my family, all my wife's family is from there, and so we that's 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 home to us. Now, do you have siblings? I do. I have, so I have a half brother. We we share the same dad. Uh, he's older than me, about nine years. Uh, and then I have two stepbrothers as well from my stepdad. So now was your stepdad kind of that guy that stepped in to be your father, your dad and him? How did that play out? Yeah. So, you know, I was fortunate enough to have two dads, you know, a lot of stepkids, unfortunately, only have one, you know, their, their dad's not in the picture and then the stepdad does step in and take, take uh, control and have a, have a pretty significant role. I was fortunate enough. My dad was still around um, and, you know, he was willing to uh, take me to the ballpark and throw batting practice to me, hit ground balls, play catch, go fishing. He bought me my first guitar, my first bowling ball, you know, anything I was into, my dad was always uh, cap capable and willing to, you know, do, do those things with me. Um, but because of the dynamic of, of me not being around him all the time, you know, my stepdad also, you know, took charge a little bit too. And, and since I was at his house most of the time, you know, he taught me how to ride my first dirt bike. He, you know, uh, taught me how to ride a lawnmower or a push mower. Um, he taught me how to hunt and shoot a gun and shoot a bow, you know? So, I mean, I was very fortunate to have two dads in that sense. Dude, that's a huge blessing because not everybody has that story coming from a, any kind of divorce situation. What what did both of those dads teach you about being a dad yourself? Uh, you know, I think for my real dad, like I said, he was uh, he was always willing and able to to be interested in the things that I was interested in and help me, you know, get better at those or just just to do those activities. And so that, that taught me really to kind of just be present with my kids, you know, whatever they're into, you know, I know some of the things that maybe I was into, my dad wasn't, but he, you know, was willing to do those things anyway. 
Um, and so I think that's the one of the big takeaways with my real dad is just be present, whatever your kids are into, do those things, whether you like them or not, you know, but that because that's what they like. And that's going to resonate a lot, you know, with with your kids is just just do it, just knowing that they have someone that supports them and whatever they like to do and is willing to at least engage with them in that in that sense. Um, and then my stepdad, you know, he taught me. He taught me a lot of like, you know, basic life lessons, like how to be smart with money, uh, you know, how to how to fix your car certain ways. If you, you know, if you break down or change tires, you know, like all that type of stuff, you know, the little things that, you know, we need to we need to be able to do on our own as adults. That's that a lot of that came from my stepdad because I was around him every day, you know, and um, some of the other things he taught me was, you know, always, always be nice and courteous to everybody. I think I always remember one of the things he used to tell me is be nice to everybody because that person may be your boss one day, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> you know, you just never know how it's going to come back around. Now, were either one of your dad's ballers, were they baseballers at all? No, no. I mean, no, no, no more than, you know, school, school athletics, but no, I, I was the rare breed, I guess. <laughs> you know, my mom, my, my mom actually played uh, semi-pro tennis nice yeah so i get i think i get a lot of that athleticism from her yeah well now so in the sense that with your knowing that your your dads and this is what i love to about being a father especially as my girls were younger is kind of bringing them along and introducing them even to stuff that i was interested in now they weren't always interested <laughs> in what right. i was interested in but but both sides of that doing what it is that they have an interest in even if you don't have an interest in it but also kind of introducing them to some of the stuff that you do right absolutely yeah um as far as my real dad you know um he didn't grow up hunting I mean, he's a big fisherman and loves to fish. So he taught me a lot about fishing. But when I, when my parents got, uh, my mom got remarried to my stepdad and I started to be uh, hunting a lot and I still to this day love to hunt and I'm, I'm all in on that stuff. You know, I, I got to share that with my dad a little bit and I've invited him to come sit with me in the woods or, you know, taught him how like to make certain recipes with like deer meat or, or, you know, all that kind of stuff that he never really experienced in his youth or up till, you know, I was interested in it. So it, it was kind of cool. We, we used to go drive around, look for deer, you know, and he would never have done that if it wasn't, you know, for something that I was interested in. And then I, as far as my stepdad, you know, um, he's a homebody. He loves to be uh, at home where he grew up. You know, if he's gone more than a week, that's too much, you know, um, and so being here in Japan and when they came over my first year here, you know, it was nice to be able to share the culture with him and, um, you know, introduce him to foods and different uh, monumental sites and historical stuff over here. So that was kind of cool to share that with, with my mom and said that. I'm taking it. You don't have a lot of area to hunt in Japan, huh? Absolutely zero. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah it's probably driving you crazy too sitting around and not doing a lot of stuff right yeah it is um you know i mean but even in the states playing baseball it's a summer sport so i miss out on a lot of the summer activities like fishing and boating and you know just being out in the sun and and enjoying the weather and and family and friends but you know that's that's what i do so i'll have plenty of that time in my older years to to enjoy all that now, is the season in Japan, does it coincide with the season in the U.S.? It does, yeah. Yeah, almost lock and step, basically, same time. Very cool. So, dude, take us back, because I know you're a great man of faith. We've had some, we had a great conversation once before. What, how, how was your, your dad, how did they influence that walk for you as a believer? Or was there an influence there? Or, or what's the story as how, how you came to know God? Yeah. So when my parents were, uh, when my real parents were together, they, you know, we, we would go to church. I grew up in the church. Um, I would say I grew up in the church and not in Christ. Uh, that's kind of what I tell people. Um, we would go to church. I'd go to Sunday school. My parents were youth group leaders. Uh, I'd go to church camp with my dad uh, at a young age and do all kinds of stuff with the church. And then when they got divorced, it just seemed like both of my parents kind of just, you know, stopped doing those things with me and I stopped going and 
Um, and then it wasn't until probably, I don't know, maybe five years ago, my dad really started getting back into going to church. Um, he found a church that he loved and reading his Bible every day, joining men's groups and, and church potlucks because my dad's a foodie. Um, so, you know, it's been nice the last several years to be able to, you know, be on the phone with my dad and we can, we can talk, uh, we can talk Jesus with each other, you know, and, and what we're, what we're hearing about at church and what we're reading in the Bible and, and stuff like that. Um, and so that's been, that's been awesome. I've been, I've been really appreciative of that the last several years because that wasn't there, uh, for a long time, uh, when I was growing up. Uh, and then my stepdad, I don't ever remember my mom and I would go to church, um, every so often after they got re after she got remarried, but I don't ever remember my stepdad ever going. Um, and then it hasn't been until the last two years that him and my mom started going back to church. Um, so I'm thankful for that. Um, and I, I think it has a little, it has a lot to do or partially something to do with, um, and I don't want to toot my own horn here, but how my wife and I are raising our kids and the stuff that we're doing. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not preaching to our parents. We don't, you know, we don't preach at them or judge them for anything. But I think just I think they've seen a change in my life. Um, you know, that's obviously Christ work in me. And um, I think they I think they've appreciated that and how we raise our kids and how our marriage works and and what we do. Um you know, outside of our house uh, uh, for the kingdom. So I, I think that's, I'm hoping that's really encouraged them. And that's just a testament to how God can work, not only in us, but through us in ways that we don't even recognize. You know what, dude, it, and it is, it's one of those things. It's what's the saying that, that people believe our actions before they believe our words. Right. right? Yeah. I think, and, it, you know, they want something tangible. They want something that they can, I mean, that's just human nature. I feel like you know, I, um, they, they would rather see somebody do something instead of just always saying something to them, you know, like they're always feeling like they're being talked to or talked at instead of leading by an example. They want something tangible that they can see and, and, and follow. Now, how long have you, have you been a believer? I have been a believer now for, I mean, like I said, I grew up in, in, in the church. I've always believed in God and in Jesus. But, uh, and I was baptized at a young age, um, you know, kind of the, one of those things that teenagers do because their friends are doing it, not really understanding what it means and what, the, yeah. you know, what it, it truly entails. Uh, but I would say I, I fully gave my life over to Christ in 2011. Um, after some stuff in my life was going wrong and it just seemed to be a broken record that stuff that had happened constantly in my life. And it was like, you know what? It's time for a change and I knew instantly who I needed to reach out to and, and where I needed to go and so I think ever since I mean it's been a it's been a work in progress let me tell you but um it was the best decision I definitely could have made for me and for my wife and for our family and for generations to come brother absolutely so piece together the story on playing college ball how you got to the MLB how you got the to the Cubs and, and all mm -hmm. that kind of put that story together for me. Uh, so I started, uh, you know, obviously playing high school, um, summer ball, all that stuff. Went to junior college in, in Champaign, a junior college called Parkland Community College. I uh, went there for two years, transferred to SIU Edwardsville. I played uh, three years there. I, I got hurt my second year and redshirted. And then I uh, came back and finished my, my eligibility that third year was drafted uh, in 2011 by uh, Kansas City Royals in the 24th round. Uh, you know, spent, a, spent my next three, four years in the minor leagues with them. And then uh, at the All-Star break in 2000, let's see, what was that? 2014, I uh, got traded uh, during the All-Star break to the Texas Rangers and made my major league debut that September, September of, of 14. And then spent the next year with the, with the Rangers in 15, up and down from the minor leagues to the big leagues. Um, 
And then in the off season of 15, between 15 and 16, I got traded to the Chicago Cubs, uh, which was like a dagger to a lot of my family because they're diehard Cards fans. They're Cardinals fans big time. And so when I was making those phone calls, people were like, are you kidding me? I can't believe I got a root. They're like, I can't believe I got a root for the Cubs now. <laughs> you know, and so that was that was kind of inter- that was kind of fun and and cool to be, you know, just bad news, but good news to them, I guess. <laughs> you know, and um, so yeah, I was with the Chicago Cubs in 16, uh, up and down in the big leagues all year. Uh, and then yeah, you know, they won the World Series that year, which was awesome. I got a World Series ring for being with the team that year. Um, and then you know, it just so happened that Japan was knocking on the door after that season. And, you know, I just, I saw some writing on the wall that, you know, I was probably going to be back in the minor leagues again, up and down again. You know, I was, I was still young in my major league career. And so I didn't, I wasn't going to probably be a guy that, um, that was going to stick right away. So, uh, Japan gave me a, a good opportunity to come here and be a part of the team full time and make some make some good money while we're here and and just uh, try to you know get better a little bit maybe use it as a stepping stone to get back to the major leagues and then four years later I'm still here <laughs> and you know what I can imagine that the culture is quite different and, and the people I think we talked about this a little bit earlier last time we talked and just the the people that you're dealing with, the Japanese, it's just such a different culture than, than U.S. T- tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it is. They do things a lot differently. Um, it's, it's, you know, in the States, it's, it's, it, people are very outgoing and, and outspoken and sometimes loud. And, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of people, they don't know a stranger, they'll talk to anybody. Um, you know, the trains are always loud with people talking and, and stuff going on on public transportation and out in public and all this. And the Japanese people are very um, introverted, I would say, you know, they don't they, they they're kind of taught and their culture is not to um, interrupt with anybody else's life, you know, because there's a lot of people here. So they're living in close quarters. I mean, I'm looking out my front window right now and, you know, houses are 10 feet apart, you know, and, you know, everybody's living on top of each other and so it's it's the cultural way just to kind of you stay kind of quiet to yourself and don't interrupt anybody else's is their life or their atmosphere and so even on the trains you know it's kind of frowned upon to be chatting in a big group or to someone else loudly on the train you know most people are heads down looking at their phone got headphones on Um, so it's just a different different culture they're not as outspoken and outgoing um they're very shy people so it it takes a while to get used to that because you know me and my wife were we like to you know converse with people we like to meet new people and and stuff like that and it's just something that doesn't happen very often over here it's probably good and bad (laughs) yeah i mean as as outgoing as we are my my wife is more of a a, like kind of a hermit she kind of likes to stay indoors and and, you know, read a book and just kind of, you know, be to herself in her own space. And that is very much the culture here. So she kind of likes that aspect of it. But when we go out, like walk, you know, and be out in public or whatever, it's just, it's kind of sad to us because, you know, we like to, we like to see the joy in people, you know, and when you're in the States, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of people that you can see, you know, they got smiles on their faces, you know, they're, they're happy to be alive and happy to be with the company that they're with. And, it's just hard to find that sometimes here, especially in Tokyo. And there's, there's so many people just, I mean, there's 40 million people in the Tokyo area. So it's, it's unbelievable. I guess it too, it's, it's probably difficult to share your faith with many because of that. Uh, yeah. Just. Yeah, it is. Um, I think Christians, Christians here proclaim Christians here make up less than 1% of the population. And so it's hard to share your faith and it's hard to have a community of believers and even, even the ones you do find, I'm not sure how well versed they are, you know, as far as, um, you know, reading the Bible and, and understanding the, the teachings in there. So I, I mean, I've been to, there's a church that we go to here. We like it. We love the people. They're awesome. Um, and I've, I have connected with several believers over here, but yeah, like teaching and 
professing the Lord's name. I mean, you got to have a, you got to have a permit to do that on the street, you know? So it's like, it's kind of, you got to go through hoops and, and a bunch of hula hoops to get through it. But yeah, it's, it's difficult and they just, they just don't understand it. You know, they don't, they don't understand the, um, the ideas behind it. Now is the main faith there or main, is it Buddhism or Hinduism yeah. or what is it? It's there's Buddhism and then there's something called Shintoism. And I, I'm not sure the difference. Uh, I guess I should have paid attention in world world religions in college, but, um, <laughs> but it, yeah, it's mostly, mostly Buddhism. But I mean, I would, I would honestly say that the vast majority of um, people in Japan are not practicing anything. Wow. You know, but, but they bow like, you know, we got guys that will come off the baseball field, turn around and bow to the field. I'm like, well, who are you bowing to? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll say that sometimes I just, cause I, I you know, sometimes I kind of like to spark up those conversations and just kind of get into the brains of some of these guys. And I was like, who, who are you bowing to? You know, tell me about that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Now you did tell me a story too about, uh, a particular player, Ben Zorbist, I think, when you were with the Cubs, yeah. and just what? And I read stories about him, and he seems like just such a stud, man, such a great mm -hmm. guy off the field. Tell me a little bit more about that. He was a big influence for you, huh? Absolutely, man. That guy is solid. Such a genuine dude, an amazing dad, awesome teammate, strong believer. I mean, it. He was a, a huge inspiration to me. Uh, just for the short time I got to spend with him in the Cubs organization, you know, and I, coming through the Royals organization, there's a ton of believers in that organization and they do a lot of great things uh, in that organization. But when I got with Zoe, when I got with Zoe, he was, you know, I could instantly see that, you know, he was just a good dude. You know um, he was a good inspiration to us as, as a married couple, him and his wife. I know they've recently gone through some, some issues. Um, but man, we were, we were just so impressed and we just were so like connected with them and drawn to them. And, and I was always drawn to Zoe in the clubhouse, you know, we would do, he would get us together and we'd do some, like a short Bible reading or some Bible studies in the clubhouse. We were doing Bible studies at his house. There was one time he grabbed me on the plane and we had a, you know, a conversation about some scripture on the plane one time, you know, so he's just a really good dude. He cares about his guys, cares about people. And I was just, you know, to me, that was just a, an amazing experience to have someone else like that in the clubhouse that I could, I could look to. That's cool, dude. I love that story and love hearing stories about those, the real deal. Right. Yeah. Those guys that are living their faith authentically and doesn't yeah. matter where they're right. at, they're they're all in. Mm -hmm. Was there a fond memory just in the Cubs organization as a whole? Was it the World Series or was there something else? Was there just a memorable moment that you'll never forget? Uh, I mean, there's one I'll never forget because it's on YouTube and it's uh there's a <laughs> there's a moment when we were in the bullpen and we had our bullpen leader, Travis Wood, that year, he, you know, he'd give us guys a bunch of crap if a foul ball came, come, you know, coming down into the bullpen. And if you moved, you were, you know, he'd give you some flack for that. So there's this one video where I think we were playing in Milwaukee and uh, I can't remember who was hitting, but it was big righty. And he just pulled one, smoked one down into our bullpen. And I'd just gotten called up that day and I'm sitting there in the chair and there's a guy next to me and Travis Wood and this ball just comes barreling towards us and nobody moves. I kind of just do one of these, like close my eyes, praying that it doesn't hit me. And it, you know, the ball hits like Travis's leg or his chair just shoots out into the left field. And uh, everybody was like, what the heck are they doing? You know, why were they, why are they just sitting there? And so it's kind of a little game we play, but yeah, that, that video is on YouTube and, uh, there was one more instance in Cincinnati where I came in to pitch and uh, I got the first guy out and Travis Wood was actually playing left field and Madden switched us. So I got to go play left field for one batter. And then I had to come back in and face the next guy. So we just switched back and forth. And so that to me, like that was kind of a highlight because you know I got to play another position, you know, and uh, my heart was pounding, you know, I was like, man, I hope, I was like, I hope I get a ball and make a great play, but I also hope I don't like duff a really easy play. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, the, the, as soon as you get out there, the first ball is probably get hit. That's yeah, what I'd that, be thinking. No, that, and that's true. That's you know, that's exactly how baseball works. It's like the guy that doesn't want the ball hit to him, it always goes to that guy. You know, and it's not that I didn't want the ball hit to me, but it was like, you know, this is this is how the baseball gods work. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna get I'm gonna get the next ball to me. I guarantee it. And then, so. sure enough, it's the whiff. You let it go right under your legs, or right something easy. You know, something you've done a million times, and it just you you mop it up. Yeah. Dude, tell me real quick. So Madden seems like, and I remember seeing him here and there in post game conferences and stuff. Seems like a pretty business as usual. What was he like to play for? Oh, he was awesome. Uh, you know, he. I always tell people, you know, Madden was one of those managers that you never saw him in the clubhouse. That was the player zone, you know, and he didn't want to interfere with that. But his door was always open. Right. And so if you had if there was an issue, you could go in there and he kind of left it up to the veteran guys to, to take care of stuff that was going on in the clubhouse. And he would never show his face in there, I think. And I think maybe we had three or four team meetings the entire year. One was in spring training. I think they had one maybe opening day, one after the all star break and then one before the postseason. And that was it. You know, he he was not a big. I'm gonna hold team meetings all the time, you know, and and he he was just a good a good manager in that sense. You know, he was good players manager where he kind of just let the players relax and play the game. You know, he, he wasn't gonna implement a lot of rules and and regulations. It was like, you know, if you, whatever you got to do to play good, I'm for that. You know, I mean, we had, I mean, mo when I was with the Rangers, we had to wear suits everywhere right on on travel days and uh the motto with madden was if you think you're if you think you look hot wear it <laughs> you know just whatever you know whatever you want to do if, if that's what you if that's who you are then do that you know and so that was that was really cool it was a lot we had a lot of fun that year dude and that seems pretty well i don't know if it's unique or not but the sense that he was he had that mentality and then he just depended, I guess, obviously on his veteran players to take care of the clubhouse and lead and do all the stuff that needs to be done. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, then you look at that team, there was some very prominent veteran players. Like I said, you had, you had Ben Zobrist, you had Jason Hayward, you had John Lester, you had Jake Arietta, John Lackey, you know, you had all those guys, Anthony Rizzo, you know, guys that have been around for a little bit and knew what they were doing. And, you know, Lester, had, you know, was with the Red Sox in that World Series, you know? And so it's like he, he knew he'd been there before. And so, yeah, uh, Madden was just like, you know, I've got the guys on the team that know what they're doing. They've been there before. They know what a winning team looks like and how it acts. And so I'm going to let them monitor that and and we'll, we'll, let, we'll let the guys play. Cool. Now, you, you have kids, right? How, what are the ages? I've got a five, three, and one about to turn two in five days. Wow, dude, you got yeah. your hands full. <laughs> I do, I do, yeah, and they're all crazy. <laughs> now, boys, girls, mix my, of the. Yep, the five and three year old are boys, and my uh, two year old is uh, a girl. Good deal. She'll be protected all her life, bro. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually thinking our boys need protected from her. She's a little oh. fire. She's a fiery one. Dude, and she'll be a tough, she'll be one tough girl to yeah. have two older brothers. But you know what? I'm like, you know what? Keep that, keep that mentality until you're about 30. That would be, that would work good for me. <laughs> exactly. Dude, what's the best thing about being a dad? Oh man. Just, you get to be a kid again sometimes, you know, like, this past week, you know, we've been staying at home as much as possible. We've, I've helped my kids build a fort in the living room and I got this little portable mini projector and we've been watching movies on, on the side of a, a, a tarp, you know, and, and we're just building forts and, you know, playing trains and, you know, shooting darts at each other. And, you know, you kind of just get to be a kid again and, and just seeing the look on their face when, when you're playing with them and, and enjoying what they like to do is, is a lot of fun for me. My wife always says that I'm actually the hardest kid she raises. So I think uh, uh, your wife's been talking to my wife because she, mine says the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the most difficult, the <laughs> most disrespectful won't listen the whole bit. Right. Right. Yep. 
she goes yeah. she introduces people these are my three kids and this is my hardest child my husband you know yeah my oldest kid mm -hmm. uh dude what's the biggest struggle you've had as a father and how'd you overcome it um my biggest struggle is probably patience you know um just understanding like i need i need to do better at just understanding that they're they're kids you know and they 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 don't know all the things that i know and and they're gonna you know they're gonna they need to test things out you know we learn by experience a lot of the time and so just having the patience with them is something that i have struggled with big time uh, and um still struggle with it sometimes but it's just sometimes you know to overcome that my wife and i have to kind of keep each other accountable and just be like hey you're going a little too far here you know or like hey you know they're just kids you know they're, they're still learning like you know stuff like that so i think the over to overcome it is is the accountability from from my wife dude and you know what i, I remember when my girls were younger too i remember catching myself especially with my oldest uh thinking and i remember saying several times you know better than that and yeah. then you know a couple of times my wife was like uh no no she She's doesn't seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah right <laughs> you know yeah. and so yeah i dude i get it because i think that was one of my biggest struggles too is the patience and then just like what how did why did she do that well hello she's a little kid so yeah dude mm -hmm. and i think that's something especially nowadays mm -hmm. where we're in with the whole you know isolation and quarantine and everything else it's like being patient oh it's a it's a test of your patience right now for sure yeah i was thinking about that the other day too i was like man if you really want to know how well or how bad you are at being a dad or being a husband quarantine yourself with your family because that'll humble you real quick for sure for sure now you shared a story with me uh, last time we were talking, you had just been to, I think, uh, it was a men's group by one of the other players, right? She kind of shared that story and one of the lessons that you learned through that. Uh, I think it's what you're referring to is I went on a duck retreat, a duck hunt retreat um, that I go on every year with uh, some current and for, for, uh, former baseball players that we do in Tennessee. And basically, it's, yeah, it's just a, it's a discipleship retreat. And we duck hunt while we're there. You know, uh, one of the, the guy that runs it, uh, Luke Hochaver, he owns this awesome duck property in, in Tennessee. He's got a beautiful cabin on it. And so we go down there for the weekend and we, we sit in a blind and we talk Jesus in the blind and we eat breakfast in the blind and we shoot ducks and, and we come back and we kind of just chill out and have a big fire and we do a discipleship kind of uh, uh, series during the weekend. And, and there, it's it's amazing. I love it. There was one thing, and it hit me and stuck with me, dude. We talked about in that one of those conversations with one of the other players, a guy said something about welcoming the interruptions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like like I said, you know, the patience thing is, is big. And so we can get so caught up in I got to fix the car. I got to mow the grass. I got to. You know, I, I got to do this. I got to do that. But, you know, our kids, they want to be with us all the time, especially my boys. And, you know, they're they are they interrupt us on things that we think that we have to get done. And so that's when that's when our tempers can can rise and like stop interrupting me. I got to get this done. I got to do this. Well, I mean, the longer you push that off, the longer you push them off to do the things that you have to do, you know, the more disengaged they're going to be from you. So he was he was saying you know we need to welcome those interruptions because those are times that you that kids are really going to be engaged with you they're really going to um, learn um, in those moments that not everything is as important as you think there's always time for your kids there's always time um, to be doing stuff with them and, and to engage with them so welcoming those interruptions really allows you to have a strong relationship with your kids because they know that um that you that you're going to be engaged with them dude and you know what i'm learning so much through these interviews that i'm doing and, and one of the guys who we just recently interviewed talked about his dad saying hey you know we're close and you're 41 years old we're good friends and we're close he says man if you want to be close to your kids when they're 41 be close to them when they're five yep yeah and I absolutely thought, wow, that's, 
That's good stuff, dude. And I love what you're saying because I was that guy before kind of God got a hold of me. I was the guy that would be sitting up in the office and the kid come in, my two-year-old would come in yelling, screaming, and, and one dad climb up my lap and I'd get all mad. Yeah. I'd be yelling at my wife downstairs, like, yeah, I'm trying to work, blah, blah, blah. Right. When, when, you know, it, they got a 30 second attention span. Right. <laughs> it right. wasn't like it was going to take more than a couple of minutes, hang out with them, and then they were going to be back off and, you know, distracted in something else, right? Yeah. You know, I think there's a, there's a line between welcoming the interruptions and teaching your kids to be patient as well, because right now we're going through that where Jill and I will have, be having a conversation or we'll be talking to somebody else and our kids are, dad, 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 you know, I mean, the, the, and so we got to teach them to be patient and to wait your turn and that not to interrupt certain things. But when it comes to like, you know, when it's just me doing what I'm doing, and they come in and, and want to play or just sit on my lap or, or talk or tell me something, you know, we need to welcome those because if you, if you, if you shut them out, then they're, you know, especially if you're doing something and they just want to come up and have a conversation, um, then it's to me that like that teaches them that, well, I can't talk to my dad about things because he's always busy or he doesn't want to hear it. And so the longer you do that, you know, when they are 40, you're not going to have a clue what's going on in their life because they don't talk to you about it. You know, and they don't so, feel like they can't approach you. Right. 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 Yeah. So when you welcome the interruptions, you almost seem, uh, you seem relatable. You seem, uh, you know, engaged, you seem uh, approachable and, you know, they will be more likely, especially at teenage, at uh, the teenage years when I imagine it's really hard for kids, you know, now they're starting to, find out who they are in the world and social clicks and, and who they, you know, what groups they're associating with and, and, and stuff like that, you know, that's the time that you want them to come talk to you, you know, the most, because I mean, with the rate of, you know, teenage suicide in, in the world is unbelievable. And, you know, you want your kids to be able to talk to you about anything and they know that you're there, that you're going to have set aside time for them for that. And, and, talk to them truthfully and honestly about that. So I think engaging that, like you said, when they're five or when they're young is, is very important, you know, and I think, I think there's uh, a Bible story that relates to that is, um, and I think this got brought up at the retreat was, uh, you know, Mary and Martha when Jesus was at, at their house and, and, you know, um, gosh, now I'm losing my train of thought. I think Mary Martha was, was all caught up. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Martha was all caught up getting the food ready and doing the dishes and and getting everything together for Jesus and 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 Mary's at at Jesus's feet listening, you know, and you know Jesus Jesus in that moment what should it was the interruption for Martha and she he didn't welcome it, you know. And Mary was like, I'm going to I'm going to welcome this interruption because this is going to, this is, this is what I need. You know, this is how, uh, this is how life's supposed to be. You know, this is something that's important. Dude, tell me if you had a young ball player sitting in front of you mm -hmm. and he wants some advice, what's the one piece of advice you'd give him? Well, uh, about life or baseball or. About, uh, yeah. About, well, that this journey you've been on, if he's looking to go play, professional baseball maybe he's even in the minor leagues what does that look like and I mean you know for him if he comes to you and says hey man what's what's the one thing that's going to help me get through this time you know obviously um looking back you know I would obviously be like you know to, for me I think my relationship with Jesus is is what got me through a lot of those years um and finding guys on the team that shared that same passion with me uh, when I was in high A with the Royals, I was on a team and we, man, we had such a strong core of believers. And we were, I mean, it was one of the only teams where we were literally discussing Jesus out loud in the clubhouse before games. Guys were bringing up questions and we were discussing it. I mean, just for everyone to hear, I mean, it was awesome. We had this huge engagement of it. It was so much fun. We had guys in Bible studies and, and stuff like that throughout the week. And Chapel had, you know, a good, a good amount of guys in it. And so to me, I'm like, man, that if I didn't have that, you know, to, to motivate me, because it wasn't because at that at that time, it wasn't really about me. It was about the other guys on the team as well. 
you know, we were pouring into each other's lives. We were sharing life with each other and it just made each day the grind and the, you know, the, you yeah, know, the grind of each day, it just kind of put that aside and we were living for something else. So I would, you know, I would probably sit down and be like, Hey man, you know, what do you know about Jesus? What do you, what do you, you know, where are you at in that? And is that something that you want to explore? If so let's do it, you know, but also too, man, there's nothing more important than family. Um, everything I, I'm doing, I mean, yeah, obviously when I first started, it was about getting to the big league, being a superstar and all that, but I've come to realize that I'm, the longer I play, the more I'm doing this for my family. And, you know, there's more things, there's other things more important than baseball. And if, if, if my family is in jeopardy, then, you know, then it's time to think about maybe getting out. Dude, I love it. Brother, good luck this season, man. And when you get back to Texas, we got to go play some golf. I know Heck you're. Yeah. Uh, you'll probably spank me like there's no tomorrow. But hey, I don't first, know about that. <laughs> before we wrap up, tell people how they connect with you. I know on Twitter. Yeah, uh, I have a Twitter handle. It's at sb patton. Um, uh, my Facebook's private, so you know I usually only follow family, a friend, family yeah. and close friends on that. But just you. Twitter. My wife has a, a Instagram account that it's like a family Instagram account. It's called the house of Patton. And she, uh, she does a lot of blogs and photos and just kind of updates people on what, what we're doing as a family and some of the stuff that we're engaged in and stuff like that. So, but mostly you can follow me on Twitter. I, I don't tweet as much anymore. I kind of get on there to read more than anything, see what's going on. But, uh, when I, when I do post something, you know, or she posts something, I'll retweet it, but it, it's not usually on Twitter. Sweet. Brother, good luck this season, man. And, and dude, I know you're busy. Got a lot going on. Appreciate you taking this time to do it. Hey, man, I'm glad we could reconnect and, and get this going. Uh, happy to be a part of it. And if you ever need me back on for anything, just let me know. Appreciate, what you, guys, appreciate what you guys are doing, too, man. I think I think in, uh, in today's society, dads are, you know, real dads are hard to come by. And there's a lot of, a lot of people that, that need a real dad in their life. And I just, you know father absence and all over the world is just a, a big problem. And I think guys need to know what it means to be a real dad and step up to the plate and, you know, take ownership in the kids that they've got. Yeah. So they're shaping the next, the next generation and the future of this world. So I think it's important for us to step in and, and teach them the ways. Amen, brother. Amen. Thank you, brother. We'll, we'll catch up soon, man. All right. I appreciate you having me on. See you, bud. See ya. Bye.